It's a great uh, honor and pleasure for Costa me to come back and, and talk here at the law school today. Uh, thanks to Josh and to the Moot Court Board as well for arranging this. Um, it's always, always good to be back in Charlottesville. Uh, Costa and I, as was mentioned, are both with Sidley Austin, where we both practice some uh, in the appellate group. Uh, and as you heard, uh, between leaving uh, friendly confines here and joining Sidley Austin, Costa and I, uh, between us, uh, have four years of clerking for uh, federal appellate court judges. So that means as between the two of us, we've seen a lot of old arguments. And to sharpen that a little bit, what it really means is we've seen a lot of really bad oral arguments. <laughs> so, going with a theory that it's always better to learn from someone else's mistakes than your own, what we hope to do today is to share with you some of our observations uh, over those four years and, and in private practice sense uh, as what makes an effective or perhaps a less effective uh, oral argument. I'm going to start off talking a little bit about history uh, of oral argument and then I'm going to turn it over to Costa to talk about some of the key points and, um, of argument, preparing for argument, and then I'll be back at the end to talk again about it, argument day itself. So, let's see if this works. Here we go. Uh, oral argument obviously has long been a cornerstone of the American uh, legal tradition. Uh, argument, oral presentation long predates the kind of formalized briefing and very you know, stylized proceedings we have today. Uh, in fact, well, it was not until 1949 that the Supreme Court actually amended its rules to actually require written briefs in cases. Now, obviously, they had written briefs before then, but as you go back in time, briefs became more precisely that, briefs. They were short summaries or excerpts from the legal authorities that would be discussed at argument. Uh, oral argument uh, used to be much longer than it is today. In the Court of Appeals today, an, an advocate will be given 15 minutes on average, and in the Supreme Court, half an hour to make their presentation. Argument used to last day, hours, if not days, for example, the oral argument in McCullough versus Maryland, a case everyone should be familiar with, lasted five days. Uh, the argument in Gibbons versus Ogden uh, lasted six days. So that's quite a while um, to be sitting and dealing with one case. Uh, the slide here is actually the, uh, or the old Supreme Court chamber in the US uh, Capitol building. I think it's beneath the Senate, but don't quote me on that. I'm sure the justices were happy to move into this facility uh, around the time of the Civil War. Uh, before that, they heard cases in any, any number of public and private buildings, including, for one stretch of time, a tavern in downtown DC. Um, given that at the time, just, justices had to handwrite their opinions, this is John Marshall's uh, handwritten version of McCullough versus Maryland. Given that they had to do that, I, I hope that they went back to the tavern uh, to knock those out. I'm told there are some porch stains on the original you know, versions. Oral argument is not just the presentation of a case to a judge. It's long played a much broader societal role, um, given that the judiciary is obviously the third branch of government. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, in the 1840s, traveling in the United States and stud studying our democracy, had this to say about our jury system, and I'll let you read it for yourselves. But his conclusion was that the jury system is a, uh, a very important part of our participatory democracy, and I think that's true. And I think that oral argument actually plays very much the same role. Most of the judiciary's work is done behind closed doors in judges' chambers and on, and on the written page. But at oral argument, judges actually have to step out from their chambers, put on their robes, and, and face the music, as it were. They see the uh, advocates and actually talk about the, uh, the law and the principles that will guide uh, their decision. And they are uh, as much under the scrutiny of the media uh, or the observers as, as anyone else there. And that is certainly true if you think about the types of things that were being decided in the early republic. Uh, the, you know, as, as judges and, and the great oral advocates of the day were wrestling with the uh, questions that the framers, uh, in their political wisdom, uh, left unanswered, you know, where they compromised and left uh, room in the joints for future lawyers to, to build their clients uh, to figure out the correct answer. Uh, obviously, Daniel Webster, uh, who we have pictured here, is one of the most famous Supreme Court advocates ever. Um, argued a couple of his important cases, Dartmouth versus Woodward, to do with the contracts clause, Gibbons versus Ogden, which I mentioned earlier, which is a Congress clause case. Uh, this is John Quincy Adams, and uh, if you've ever seen the movie The, uh, the Amistad, uh, after he left the, uh, I don't know how many presidents went back to private practice, uh, those who were lawyers at least, obviously Taft became Supreme Court Justice, but Adams took on the case of the Amistad Africans, uh, which was a case that became a rallying cry or you know, a focal point for the abolitionist movement uh, in the 1840s and had to do with uh, whether uh, slaves who uh, escaped and took over the ship that they were on had to be returned to their um, Spanish owners. And so there's very much, uh, very much uh, relevant, politically relevant and socially relevant drama 
that's being played out in the courtroom. Now, apart from its societal role, oral argument has also long played a bit of a social role in the days before radio and television. Uh, a ticket to a oral argument uh, on a big case between a couple of lions at the bar. It was really a hot ticket. A good thing to go see. And one of the most noted early advocates was a gentleman by the name of William Pinckney, who we have pictured here. Now, Pinckney was known on occasion to argue drunk. It happens. Of course, if you studied alcohol consumption in the 17th and 18th centuries, you actually know that the more remarkable thing would be an advocate who was not drunk. <laughs> but putting aside his fondness for the bottle, Pinckney was viewed by many as being one of the most uh, eloquent and skilled pure practitioner uh, of the oral arts. Um, he was known to be very colorful. He was thought to be very highly stylized in both his manner of speech and his manner of dress. Uh, Chief Justice Taney commented of Pinckney that he approached dandyism if did not actually achieve it. <laughs> now Pinckney was a performer and he would aim to please and he especially aimed to please the, the set of Washington Society ladies who would come to see him and he was known he was known if he saw a group of ladies enter the court late, he would actually restart his argument. Now, it's a little hard to do that today when you've got 15 minutes. So maybe that's why they shortened down the time lines. Anyway, why are we talking about this? What's the relevance today? I would say that much of what I've said about oral argument historically remains true today. Uh, what oral argument does today is it pulls lawyers, it pulls us out from behind our computers and makes us face, face each other. No one's argument is as good once a judge starts asking questions as it is on paper. It's very easy to whitewash over and gloss past the tough questions. But when you actually have to answer a question from someone who can demand that you answer the question, it's much harder. That's a very, uh, very salutary thing for the development of the law. It also puts a public face on judicial proceedings. As I said earlier, judges do most of their work behind closed doors. Um, but oral argument makes them come out and actually tilt, uh, tip their hands and talk about the principles which they're going to be uh, applying. And finally, I would suggest that oral argument maintains today a lot of the societal relevance that it has in years past. Uh, if you look at, uh, take from, from the many legal dramas on television to kind of quasi-reporters like Greta Van Susteren to Court TV, I don't need to just pick up Greta, but there, all the networks have, or the broadcast, the news networks have someone like her. Um, you know, it suggests that uh, that argument judicial proceedings remain very relevant and very much in the public consciousness. It's not surprising, for example, that the Supreme Court rushed out transcripts of cases such as Bush versus Gore much faster than it ordinarily would, because it's a very relevant, both socially and politically, uh, proceeding. So what is the state of oral argument today? Well, in recent years, I think there's general agreement, I should, recent years, but in the past century, that the art of oral argument uh, was somewhat on the way uh, as the shift to law-intensive briefing occurred. Uh, there was less stress put on oral presentation. Uh, but in recent years, the last two decades, I would say principally, uh, large firms and, and small firms have devoted increasingly more resources to, to the oral arts, uh, be it uh, at the appellate level or the presentation of law-heavy briefs, such as motions for, motions for summary judgment in the district court. Because as cases, as litigation becomes increasingly complex, uh, and as uh, judges' times, client's money and advocate's time becomes much more precious. Uh, the ability to crystallize and synthesize the key law and the key facts and bring it together in a short but, but uh, uh, pointed presentation uh, is that much more important. And as we see that uh, going forward, hopefully see a resurgence of the, of the appellate arts. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Costa and talk about getting ready for oral argument. wanted to say hello again. Um, like Gordon said, we're very happy to be here. And uh, try to give you a little uh, sense of history, as Gordon did, and, and my part it, it is maybe more basic. Um, uh, as you heard, uh, you know, both of us are, uh, relatively speaking, young attorneys, and I certainly am. I graduated in 2004 from this school, so, you know, I, I can't come and tell you here that I have, you know, a career's worth of uh, wisdom to impart. Uh, but I can tell you that you'd be surprised how quickly uh, you can see a variety of, of styles out there. Um, and if you clerk for a year or if you uh, just go work for a law firm or, or, or for some government uh, agency and spend some time in court, I mean, there's a lot uh, of different 
argument styles, and there's a lot, there's a lot of good argument, but there's a lot of uh, fairly bad argument too, um, which, which I was a little bit surprised by. So what I will try to do is start, works, I will talk about preparation, but before I get to preparation, I thought we'll try to list just a few uh, basics uh, for oral argument that are uh, just as valid whether you're a 1L, uh, getting ready to do your first uh, argument, or whether you're a practicing attorney. Uh, the first, I think, is to make the argument count. Uh, it's kind of obvious sounding, but uh, the point is that, as Gordon said, oral argument is not an opportunity for you to read your brief to the court. Uh, it's not an opportunity for you to just sort of repeat everything. Uh, these days and in you know many years now courts uh, get very thorough briefing the judges read the briefs the clerks read the briefs uh, so they really don't need you there to just repeat everything else uh, what it is instead is it's your one chance to interact with the people who are going to be making the decision it's your one chance to grapple with the hard issues uh, not just in some way where you can present it the way you want but answering whatever question comes um, and because courts do make most of their decisions uh, out of the public eye and out of, you know, any interaction with you, I think it's your one chance to, to actually engage uh, the person whom you're trying to persuade. I think it's very important for that, and I think that affects how you prepare for oral argument and what you try to get out of it. The second point, sorry if I'm talking a little uh, is to be prepared for either a quiet or live bench. Uh, this is a pretty commonly noted point. I imagine most of you have heard by now uh, that most courts these days, certainly appellate courts where there's more than one judge on a panel, you'll get up there and it won't be 15 or 20 seconds before you get your first question. And it's not at all uncommon to be peppered with questions the whole way. Uh, and that makes it challenging because you're there to present uh, a coherent argument uh, and yet you have to do it uh, even though you will be interrupted often. So that's something you have to be prepared for and you shouldn't let it uh, throw you. Uh, and I'll talk in a minute about some techniques you can do in preparing uh, to, to deal with a live bench. On the other hand, it's also possible you'll get up there and the judge or judges won't say anything. Um, so you need to be able to get up there and give a presentation. Uh, one of the first cases I heard or helped out with when I was a clerk uh, involved, was in the DC Circuit and involved the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And it was clearly a complicated case. Uh, you know, the plaintiffs had gone on, they went their full 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, lots of questions. And then the FERC lawyer got up and he said, well, you know, your honors, I think what the commission did here is correct. Um, I don't have any comment, but I'll answer your questions. And, and I was a little shocked, and I think the judges were too. You, you have to be ready uh, both to give a presentation and also to have that presentation interrupted. The last point, uh, and th this may be my sort of one takeaway point, if, if, if you don't take away anything else from what I say. Um, I think it's very important, and I've heard uh, people with, with lots of experience, people who are judges, uh, federal judges, state judges, name it, um, bemoan the fact that not all attorneys balance their role as advocates. Uh, with their other role as an officer of the court and as somebody who's supposed to make the court's job easier. Uh, and that's easy to understand. You work on a case for a long time. Whatever you thought of the merits of your case when you first started working on it, after a month, after you've written the briefs, you've probably convinced yourself that you're right. You've probably convinced yourself that your slant on the cases at issue and on the key facts is the right one. But you have to understand that the person whom you're, you're talking to uh, is coming at it from a neutral perspective. So you have to find a way to advocate, advocate strenuously and zealously, uh, but don't gloss over the parts of your case that are weak. Don't try to hide from them. Uh, because then you're not interacting with the court. You're just sort of giving a, a party line. And I think when, what really upsets judges is when one side gets up and uh, essentially says, you know, everything we said was right, every case they said is wrong, we're clearly right, we should win. They sit down and the other side says the same thing of their case. 
uh, in, in those situations, nothing much is gained by oral argument. So I think if you find a way to balance arguing the, uh, for your point and for your client with the ability to concede things that should be conceded, I think you build trust with the court um, and you actually have a chance, a much better chance of getting somewhere. Um, now with those uh, basics, uh, now that we've gone through those basics, I'm just going to go through a few slides of tips and, and thoughts on preparing, sorry, preparing for oral argument. First part of the preparation is obviously figuring out what you're going to say. And where I would begin here, um, and where I think a lot of successful advocates begin, is by really trying to boil, boil your case down. Uh, you've written the brief, you've worked on the brief, but the brief can be 20, it can be 30 pages long. And what's different in oral argument is, is that time is very tight. So you have to figure out in advance of argument how to really get your case down to two or three key questions, two or three key propositions. Um, and I know that my old boss, uh, now Chief Justice Roberts, uh, before he was a judge, was one of the leading uh, appellate practitioners uh, in DC and in the country, and he would spend a lot of time before a case trying to figure out how to say things as succinctly as possible and how to answer any question no matter how far out of left field it was by coming back to his key principles. So if you do that work ahead of time, it'll be a lot easier for you to uh, deal with things that come up in argument in real time and to retain some control over what's happening, even though you're not the one asking the questions. The second, uh, the second thing to think about uh, as you're beginning to put your argument together is, uh, to take some time and get to know uh, both the strengths and the weaknesses of your case. Uh, I guess a preliminary point, if somebody's bothering to hear the argument, you probably have both. Um, you know, if it was really that obvious one way or the other, uh, there probably wouldn't be an argument in it. There probably wouldn't be an appeal, uh, or whatever the circumstances may be. Um, and I think it's important to spend time uh, thinking about both, both sides of your case. Uh, for your strengths, what I find happens is that, you know, you rely on, say, some case or some set of facts so much, or, or it was just obvious to you that, it's, uh, that it helps you out, that sometimes you don't think critically uh, ahead of the argument and, and really try to sort of discredit your own strengths. Uh, and I find if you take the time to do that, you think of precedent controls, really ask yourself ahead of argument, try to think of ways why it wouldn't, uh, and then be able to answer those uh, questions and concerns. Then you can convince somebody else uh, that your strengths really are strengths. Um, and just as importantly, uh, you're going to have weaknesses. Uh, in some cases, you have good law, but you have terrible facts. Um, in some cases, you have to get around a precedent that's kind of tough to get around. Um, in some cases, you are here before a rule, and it sounds very reasonable in your case, but maybe in a hypothetical that's not too far removed, it, it begins to sound a little weird. Um, and I think it's important to grapple with these ahead of time. Like Gordon said, you can kind of hide them in your brief, but you can't hide them when the judge asks you about them point blank. And uh, you will see a lot of arguments where people just don't answer the hard question. Even, you know, appellate arguments, even Supreme Court arguments where they just sort of keep ducking. And, and, and that never gets you anywhere. So what you have to work on is acknowledging your weaknesses and, and finding a direct uh, and convincing way to explain why those weaknesses don't control the outcome of your case. Um, and, and there's a variety of ways to do that, but uh, the, the bottom line is don't run from your weaknesses, just put them in the context of the case and argue for your, your outcome. Uh, next, what we have here, how to deliver your argument. This is just sort of uh, some basic stuff. There's no... Um, There's no one right way to do it. Uh, some people go up with just an outline, you know, some kind of piece of paper uh, or the brief. Some people uh, go up with a, with a part of the record uh, because they want to be able to refer to a document or they make them feel better uh, in case they get some kind of question they weren't anticipating. Um, some people go up there with nothing at all. Uh, 
Paul Clement, who uh, was the Solicitor General uh, for the last few years until recently, uh, and argued, you know, every other week in the Supreme Court, never brought up a piece of anything with him because uh, I think he felt it just sort of got in his way. Um, there's no wrong uh, approach. The only wrong thing to do, I think, I have another bullet point here. If you do bring something up there, please don't just read. Uh, again, the point of uh, oral argument is to be interactive, it's to engage the, the questions you get. It's not just to deliver a rehearsed presentation. Now, as for how to prepare, uh, again, there's no one way to do it, but I think there's some commonalities uh, that, that most oral advocates share. The first one is you want to try to anticipate <coughs> arguments, anticipate the questions you will get from the court. Uh, and that's not so easily done. Obviously, the place you start is your opponent's brief. You know, if they've argued something up and down in their brief, you're probably going to hear from it, uh, and uh, certainly in their presentation, and, and some judge uh, will ask you about it. But the hard part is in anticipating the things that aren't in the briefs. Almost every oral argument, you'll get a question, uh, particularly if you have a larger panel. You know, say, uh, you know, in an appellate court, it's usually three judges, in the Supreme Court, it's nine. At least one of those nine people has thought of something that's kind of off the charts, or may seem off the charts to you. Uh, and, and what you don't want to do is stop and think for a minute. It's okay to stop and think a little bit, but you don't want to get derailed uh, by, by some kind of unanticipated argument. Uh, so what? What I try to do, and what I think everyone tries to do, is sort of step outside the box a little bit. Uh, you know, take some part of your brief, some part of your case that you thought was pretty obvious, so maybe you didn't spend a lot of time on it when you were writing the brief. A good activity before argument is to just sort of pick, pick a part of it up and say, well, you know, this thing that I, neither me or not, nor my opponent have argued a lot about, what if there's a question about that? Where could that lead? Uh, you know, ask yourself, come up with a couple questions. And you'll be surprised. Sometimes you get those questions in court. And if you can handle them, you put that one judge to rest and you get back to what you want to do uh, in your time. And the other part, uh, obviously, of getting ready for oral argument is practice. Uh, and I say obviously, I, mean, I hope it's obvious, but um, in case it's not, practice is, I believe, the most important thing. Um, you feel like you're familiar with a case when you've written the briefs, but the first time you stand up and try to deliver a practice argument, you will realize that you're going to go slow, that you're going to seem disorganized, that you're going to go back and forth, and that's natural. And the only way you get that out uh, is through practice. Again, there's no right or wrong way to do it. A common thing is to do moot courts. Uh, we at Sidley Austin do lots of moot courts. Uh, if one of our attorneys is arguing a case, we usually do uh, at least one in the court um, if it's, uh, you know, if, sort of, if the circumstances warrant, but it, it tends to happen in a number of cases. And we also participate in a lot of pro bono cases, at least one or two of which are argued uh, in the Supreme Court every year, where we'll, we'll help out some, you know, local attorney, say, a, a, you know, a public defender who's never had an appellate argument, let alone a Supreme Court argument, and all of a sudden now, uh, through, through luck and chance and, and circumstance, they're, they're going to have one. And we will put them through three or four moot courts uh, because it's just, it gets easier uh, the more you've done it uh, and the more you've dealt with the uh, aspects of your case on your feet. Uh, you can also practice more informally. What I always like to do is just talk to a colleague, uh, talk to a friend, somebody who uh, sometimes has been working on the same case, sometimes has not, and just try to give uh, my version of the oral argument or feel their questions. Um, and. I, people always ask good questions, and the more time you spend practicing, the more you'll appreciate every question, even if uh, it's, 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 it's maybe rather superficial. You can think of what it leads to in your case, and you can still use it uh, to practice. Um, and finally, uh, some portion of the practice, and uh, it depends on your style, is just rehearsing it alone. And some people lock themselves in a room and, and practice oral argument. Um, as I said, what the chief used to do was uh, practice getting, a answering any question he could conceive of, but getting back to the points he wanted to talk about. Uh, and it's, it, it really is worthwhile. The, the 
this is this last bit is probably a, a little more relevant for, for when you get out to practice, um, or, or maybe for the later stages of the moot court competition. But out in practice, a lot of times you know who you're going to be arguing for. Uh, most appellate courts uh, release the panel information ahead of time, so you know which judges you'll be before. Obviously, if you're in district court, there's only one judge that's here in your case, and, and you get to know that person pretty well. Um, and if uh, in a setting like uh, like the Supreme Court or State Supreme Court, there all the judges are there. Um, and if you do know your panel, it's worthwhile to try to figure out uh, how to field each of their questions. Um, they all have different styles, uh, and uh, it's so it's always a good idea just to go sit in on the court, hear how these people uh, interact. You know, most people are most judges are very polite. Some are kind of scary and not polite. Uh, and it's just, particularly for those, uh, it, it, it's best to figure that out at a time before you're actually up there giving the argument. Um, and it's also a chance for you, if you know your judges, to look at what they've actually said on the subject. You know, if, if they've issued rulings, uh, if they've given speeches, whatever. Uh, it just gives you a sense of, of who they are. They might help you. Uh, but, well, uh, the one thing I, I I would, I would uh, add to that is, uh, while you want to think about the judges individually, don't lose sight of the fact that at the end it's the court that makes the law. It's the court that you're arguing to, and you need the court to agree with you, or at least a majority of the court to agree with you. So uh, you want to think about how to deal with particular judges. You want to be prepared for their uh, you know, jurisprudential preferences and styles, but you don't want to ever lose sight and try to win one judge and in the process lose the rest of the court. Um, and the last thing I'll leave you with here, uh, if you know your panel, you should uh, at least try to be able to address them by name. And we have a couple of examples here. Uh, you may have heard of the case of Bush v. Gore, and you would think, and I'm sure the attorneys were very prepared, we just have a couple of snippets from the argument there. Would it not make sense to assume that the standard you use for damage That's getting two of the seven wrong, uh, including one mistaking Justice Stevens for Justice Brennan, which, you know, I don't know, maybe that's a compliment, maybe that's an insult, but, you know, depending on your, your predilections, but Justice Brennan hasn't been on the court since uh, 91, I believe. Um, so, so you would think you'd get that right, and I got one more for you. introduction to what Gordon's going to talk about because I'm pretty sure that Laura actually knew the difference between Justice Souter and Justice Ginsburg, but you kind of get flustered when you're up there talking and there's uh, some things that he'll share about uh, maybe uh, making you less flustered and more comfortable when you're up there. Thanks. Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg actually exchanged t-shirts. Justice O'Connor has one that says, I'm Sandra, not Ruth. And Justice Ginsburg has one that says, I'm Ruth, not Sandra. So, let me take a quick poll. Who, who, how many one L's do we have? All right, two L's? Okay, three L's? There couldn't possibly be three L's here. All right, good, good for you guys. Just curious, uh, kind of where in your legal training you are. All right, so let's turn to argument day now. So you've, uh, you've thought about your arguments, you've read the record below, 
you've written your brief, it's been submitted, you've prepared, you've gone through the, the coast of preparation steps, and now you're sitting at council's table, and your opponent's wrapping up, and you're about to stand up, and you realize that this scares the bejesus out of you. You have no idea what you're about to do. Well, that's pretty typical. It's a combination of performance anxiety, which does go away somewhat over time, depending on who you are, um, and it's also a combination of a very natural uh, hesitancy towards the unknown. Oral argument is an extremely fluid situation and can be extremely unpredictable. And if you're not just a little bit nervous, well, there's probably something a little bit wrong with you. And no matter how many times you stood in the well, whether you're standing up for your first time or you've been there dozens of times, you're going to feel some of that hesitancy. And so the first thing to do is to recognize, I will feel nervous, and I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to relax, and I'm going to control myself. Well, how do we do this? The first thing I would tell you to think about is speed. When you're nervous, everything speeds up. It just does your breathing, your heart rate, the room seems to move faster. It seems like you know, everyone's talking quickly, except you. You yourself seem like you're talking really slowly, even though you're talking 90 miles an hour. Um, and so you focus on speed, focus on breathing more slowly, focus on thinking more slowly, then calmness will follow from that. At least I hope it will. It does for me. The next thing I would tell you to think about, and this is actually right before you stand up, is distractions. It's very, very unlikely that you will need a pen when you're at the podium in an oral argument. So don't bring one with you. It's very unlikely you will need a giant binder with all of the briefs and all the amicus briefs and, and, and the 4,000 page record. If you need that, go get it. Don't bring it with you unless you have a really good reason to. If you're someone who likes to jiggle change in your pocket, or jiggle your keys, or you play with things, Leave them at the table, leave them at home, leave them somewhere, anywhere other than where they will become distractions. Because all they are is crutches, you don't need them. And when you get flustered, you don't know the answer to a question, that's where you're gonna start playing with, whether you realize it or not. So, good, a preemptive strategy, tie yourself to the mast, leave those things at home. But really, how bad could it get, right? It's just an oral argument. For the first years, during my first year uh, oral argument, uh, this wasn't my round, it was the round before me, the argument before me, uh, a fellow did actually faint while doing his argument. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's okay, it's okay, because the judges and the, and the moot court folks are very understanding. They gave him 15 minutes to wake up and recover, and then he had to go on with his argument. <laughs> it's just fine. But he was in good company, though, I'll tell you. In 1895, General Thomas Ewing, a Civil War veteran, I think, <coughs> Actually, well, I'm not positive about that. He fainted and he collapsed at the Supreme Court while he was arguing the case of Farmers Loan and Trust, uh, P and S R versus Cobra. Uh, and she fainted boom, right there on the floor in front of the justices. Now, the remarkable thing about this was that 30 years before, in 1869, Senator Thomas Ewing, the aforementioned general's father, had also fainted in front of the Supreme Court <laughs> in the argument of McGuire versus Tyler. And so this newspaper article reported that the son, I'm sorry, the father hit the floor about three feet from where his son sunk into the carpet. <laughs> it's kind of pedigree you're really not looking for in this business. You know, nor were they alone. In 1944, uh, counsel for one of the parties in the case of Hazel Atlas Glass Company uh, also had a fainting spell. Justice Douglas picture here, asked him a question about a certain affidavit that has been, been submitted to the court. The justice apparently didn't agree with it or didn't appreciate it. And counsel, again, managed to actually hit his head on counsel's table, which if you've been to the Supreme Court is kind of over here. So that's a substantial fainting spell. Anyways, but the justice wanted an answer to his question. So court was adjourned, the doctor was brought in, the fellow was revived, and the justice was still standing there. So the fellow wakes up and confessed that he, in fact, had drafted the offending affidavit. Nor was that the worst thing to ever happen at the Supreme Court. Meet Thomas Addis Emmett. In 1827, this poor fellow actually died <laughs> during a Supreme Court argument. So, for you first years, I will tell you that the bar for having actually died out there is set pretty low. I think you'll be okay. I should say, one footnote to this. At the time, the newspaper reported that this, there was something, quote, glorious and conciliatory in the manner of his death. <laughs> I, I could live without that in my obituary, frankly. All right, let's get back to actually some real, real stuff here. Okay, the first sentence. Chances are, at some point in your career, you will have an oral, an oral argument where the only sentence you actually own is the first one. 
So make it a good one. Now you're taught to begin with the facts of the case, or at the very least asked to dispense with the facts of the case. In my experience, that's very rarely how oral arguments go. Your best approach to starting is tell the panel why you, why you win. I mean, there's one thing you can tell them while you're up there. If you control nothing else, surely you want to tell them why you should win. So there's a number of formulations to do this. May it please the court? There are three reasons why my client wins. May it please the court? This case turns on the fact that, dot, dot, dot. This appeal turns on two, two key facts, which make clear why the decision below should be reversed. Now, I phrase all these with a number, usually, because if you say a number, it's just polite for the, judge, judges, the just, judges or justices to let you get out you know, the number of things you said you will. If you get right to them, that is. You know, I love the, uh, I'm gonna make quick three points, and then the first point lasts you know, three minutes, at which point, you know, forget about it. So, I have three, you know, uh, my client should win for three reasons. One, two, three, get them out there. Why? A couple of positive effects. First, it tells the court your key points right off. It tells them why you think you should win, which as I said, is a very important thing to share with them. Secondly, it establishes a roadmap. Costa talked about something which is very important, which is having things, having positions to fall back to, having those key principles, the reasons why you know you win. If you get a tough question, a good way to answer it is to do exactly what Costa explains Chief Justice Roberts would do, which is go back to your core principles, your first principles, and then reason towards the answer. And if you set those out at the beginning, then when you do that, the justices know, the judges know why you're doing it. It doesn't look like you're just evading the question. And so it gives you a very useful crush to fall back to, which is much better than a pen or change in your pocket. Interacting with the panel. Oral argument, the best oral arguments are a conversation. Oral arguments should not be, as Costa said, it shouldn't be someone just reading a prepared speech. It shouldn't be a lecture. It shouldn't be you lecturing the court, and God forbid it should hopefully not be the court lecturing you, although I have seen that happen. It shouldn't just be a one-sided interrogation where you stand there like a punching bag and take every question they can throw at you. It should be a conversation where you engage the judges, engage the panel on the issues that they think are important to them and that you know are important to them. Take their questions, and in answering them, talk about the things that they need to know to render a decision in favor of your client. And talk to them in a conversational tone. Thank you, Judge Smith. That's a great question that really goes to the heart of the matter. Let me try to answer it this way. Be conversational. It's, it's awkward when you first get up because you're talking, ooh, these are judges. Oh, I'm just a little lawyer. And I'm really, really scared. <laughs> but if you can be conversational, it's, it's I think, the most effective style of, or, of oral advocacy. I mean, unless you're Plato. Actually, was Plato a good speaker? I don't know. Unless you're, you know, a really, really good speaker, in which case. <laughs> My mind fails me. Quick change. <laughs> so it's a conversation. What do you need to do as an advocate? The first thing you need to do is to listen. Listen to the question. You have your points that you want to make. I know that. You know that. The judges know that. But they're wearing the robes. They get to ask the questions. You have to listen to the questions. Pay attention to the questions you get. Not just so you actually answer the question and don't annoy the judge by not answering the question but because the questions are an opportunity for you to understand how the judges are seeing your case. By the time, if you were on, the you know, on a case in the trial court, you've been living with this case for a year, two years, three years, you know it inside and out. All the judges know is your brief, your opponent's brief, and maybe a slice or two of the record. And so they're coming at it with a much smaller and much more focused body of knowledge, and maybe, maybe thinking about it in a case, in a way, as Costa mentioned, that you've not thought about it. You're over here, they're over here. Listen to the questions because it tells you where they're coming from. It tells you what they're interested in and what they're not interested in. It tells you how they perceive the case. Even if you don't think it's the best question in the world, or even a particularly intelligent question, it gives you information. So listen to it carefully and deal with it and answer it to the best of your ability. And that's what I actually just made, which is answer the question. Uh, even if it's a hypothetical question, even if it's not a particularly insightful question, it's always helpful, I find, to attempt to answer a question with a yes or a no at the outset that you can. It's respectful to the judges, and it lets them know you actually are trying to answer their question. And if it's not a yes or no question, explain to them. Let me answer that this way. It'll take a minute, but I'm going to come back, and I am going to answer your question if you just bear with me. Give them a little roadmap so they don't think that this person is just ignoring me and answering with a question that he wants to answer instead of my question. Also, before I go to that, 
Think about the big picture when you're answering questions. You have to think about the broader context of law that surrounds your case. Judges are concerned with getting your case right, but they're also concerned about the implication of the rule that you're asking for on the next dozen cases. And so you have to know, you have to have thought about beforehand how far your rule of law will stretch. Costa talked about this somewhat. And you have to give, be able to give judges clear guidance on what the position you're advocating for this case means in future cases. And we'll talk a little, in a little bit about hypotheticals. Finally, try to maintain some control of the argument. As I said, the judges get to answer the questions. But you actually have more knowledge than they do. You know the case and probably you know the law better than they do. And so you will learn to answer questions by first answering the question, say the first couple of sentences, and then the second couple of sentences are a little bit different from the question, and then the next few sentences are actually the point that you want to make. And if you do that seamlessly, you get to both make them happy by answering the question and making the point that you want to make. A good advocate always goes back to his or her essential core points, the reasons that you win. And that's something that just comes with practice and comes with time. All right. How to field a question. As I said earlier, they get to wear the rose. It's one person, three person, three people, five people, or seven people, or nine people. Very rare that courts have even numbers. Only that number of people in the room get to wear a robe, and you are not one of them. They get to ask the questions they want, and from your perspective, there is no more incisive, brilliant, interesting, and thoughtful question than the one being asked of you. <laughs> Think first before you answer. This is a rule that is often ignored at lawyers at attorneys' peril. When you're standing up here, pauses seem to last much longer than they actually do. And so the person asks a question, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, if I don't get an answer to this out right away, I'm going to look like an idiot, and I'll look like I know what I'm talking about. That's an answer. Stop. Think about the question. Make sure that your answer will be an intelligent one. Don't obviously ignore or evade a question. That's a good way to lose a judge. Find the part of the question that you can answer, that you agree with, that you actually do think is incisive, brilliant. And focus on that. It's a good place to start your answer. The judge will like you. Acknowledge complexity. As Costa said, there were two sides to a case. Chances are it wouldn't be argued in court. Sometimes you do have really, really stubborn clients who insist on going forward with cases, even though you've told them you will lose. But that's pretty rare. So acknowledge complexity. Acknowledge the need for balance. Um, and, the, and your answer will seem much more convincing and much more honest. And then finally, at some point in your career, you will be asked what I've called the crazy hypothetical. It's actually a little more complicated than that. It's a question that assumes its own answer. It is long. It is argumentative. It is compound. It signals the judge's position. Usually it's semaphore. <laughs> it is out of left field. And the question is, what do you do as an advocate? And the answer is, well, let's listen. Mr. Keeley. Justice Breyer talking. Hey, that is what you, so look, you look at that thing. You think with this genius did, I'm not going to be a genius, is it's a wheel to turn around. And the wheels turn around in fixed proportion to when you move, make the accelerator go up and down. Now, I think since high school, a person has known that he had three parts in a machine. Let me actually, I'm going to stop it for a second. I'm going to need some context. It makes much more sense with some context. <laughs> I, I meant to do that. I just didn't. Remember what I said earlier about crutches? I shouldn't have brought this with me because I keep looking at it and forgetting what I mean to say. Uh, this case was a, a patent appeal, um, and it regarded a new, new type of pedal, uh, a gas pedal in a car that had a sensor on it. Um, so it was uh, you know, wired, you know, hardwired or hard whatever to the car. And, you know, uh, the sensor would understand the pedal was being moved and, and would send that to the engine. Um, and the question under the patent statute was whether this was novel, uh, whether it was patentable. Okay, with that in mind, let's try it. Sorry. So he said, 
he looks to something that, that moves, and he sticks a sticker on it. Now, now, to me, I grant you I'm not an expert, but it looks about the same level as I have a sensor on my garage door at the lower end, and it's when the car is coming in and out, and the raccoons are eating. So I think the brainstorm of putting it on the upper end. Okay? Now, I just think that, that how can I get a patent for that? And, and that, that, so that's very naive. That's very naive. But, but the, 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 the point is, I don't see what we're talking about. And, and what is it supposed to happen with all these affidavits? I mean, what I've worked out with the, the, the raccoons are annoying uh, the, the, the machine at the bottom of the, of the garage door. And that's a problem. So I move it to the top of the garage door. Is that something? Uh, nobody before it thought moving into the top of the garage door. Nobody before it thought moving into a different part that moves in a constant ratio. awfully long time to stand at the podium. And that's actually the shortened version of the clip. You can answer the question about, do things move in a fixed ratio? Is this invention like that? You can answer the part about, what do we do with these affidavits that are in the record, or, or the ones that weren't in the record? Or do you address Justice Breyer's heartfelt concern about the raccoon that is eating his garage door sensor? <laughs> Whichever part you choose to answer, I know that your answer begins something along the lines of Justice Breyer. Thank you for that question. It goes right to the heart of the case. <laughs> I know it certainly does not start. Thank you for that question, Justice O'Connor. <laughs> All right, the frivolity. Facts in the law. When you stand up, I think you can assume that the judges have read your briefs. Uh, it's very rare these days, and that doesn't happen. And if you're, if you're you know, in court on an overnight you know, temporary restraining order, then you might have to actually explain what's going on, because the judges feel bleary-eyed from being dragged out of bed. But other than that, judges typically understand the legal position in the brief. They know the argument you're making. And what they want the answer to is a couple of questions. First, how does the law mesh with the facts of your case? And B, how does the rule that you propose apply to other situations? And both of these are very, very not completely, but very well addressed by mastery of the record. And the record is everything, this is in the Court of Appeals, obviously. The record is everything that happened in the trial court. Uh, and uh, uh, when the case goes up on appeal, the district court clerk boxes it all up and shifts it off to the Court of Appeals. And then the uh, parties uh, take materials out of that and do a smaller bound volume, which judge will actually be sent to chambers. And as the lawyer, one of the best value-added things that you can bring to argument is knowing what's in that record, understanding it, mastering it. Any lawyer can learn the case law pretty quickly. But the record is what you add to oral argument. It's what you, as someone who has lived with the case, contributes. So learn it, know it, love it. Why? Because appellate judges love to have a fact or two that will resolve the case before them. Because they don't have to draw a messy rule that could be applied to two dozen other cases and can take get taken this way or that way. If they can just articulate an established principle of law and say this fact makes this case go this way, they love those kind of opinions. Makes, they can get home early for dinner, those kind of cases. The oral argument is where you can drive those facts home. Don't worry about that hypothetical judge. It's very different from this case. Here's why. If you understand the facts, you understand the record, you can, you can fend off the hypotheticals. You know, the judge who thinks he's against you is not quite positive. She's a little concerned, she's a little concerned that the rule you're suggesting kind of spin off in this crazy way. If you understand your record, you can present facts about this case which foreclosed that case, and that makes her a happy judge. So I couldn't, I cannot stress enough understanding, you know, when you stand up, knowing the record uh, inside and out. Another thing that mastering the record does for you uh, is it allows you to apply facts to the judge's view of the law. Going back to what I said earlier about questions, signaling how judges are thinking about the case. You don't know that until they start asking, answering, or asking <coughs> questions. But once they do ask that question, you see where they're coming from, then you think, 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 through the record what facts answer the rule of law that they have in their mind. It also allows you to foreclose trickery. When your learned opponent on the, on the other side stands up and says, what is is, if what is ain't, you better be able to say that. So again, record very important. Now, when you're staffing an appeal, I, I find there it's very important to have both trial counsel and appellate counsel involved. Now, sometimes trial counsel makes such a hash of it that they're nowhere to be seen. It's usually good to have someone who's actually there who understands what strategic decisions were made, 
who remembers the affidavits that were submitted to the court, the district court, five years earlier in support of some piddling little motion that everyone's forgotten about, because it's all part of the record, and it could be important. I will say that there are times when mastery of the record can go a little too far. When I was clerking on the Eighth Circuit, I saw one argument. Uh, this was in Omaha, where a fellow who was perceived as being one of Omaha's top defense lawyers uh, was in the Eighth Circuit presenting an argument. And some very, very smart trial lawyers, their brains turned to mush in the court of appeals. The, the case, his, his client was a, a convicted felon, and he'd been convicted of drug crimes and involved in possession of a gun. And one of the judges, just looking to confirm this, said, uh, said now counsel, your client was arrested with a gun, is that right? And he said, yes, your honor, but it was a small gun, it was just a derringer. <laughs> well, statute doesn't say in possession of a large gun, in possession of a small gun, it says gun. And the judge, this was Judge Bowman, responded, well, wasn't Lincoln shot with a derringer? <laughs> <laughs> so, that didn't help. Next point, time management. Time management is very important. Um, you want to hit your key points. Most courts of appeals now have uh, multiple time rec recording or time uh, tracking devices. Uh, I was in the Tenth Circuit a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, right in front of the, the presiding ju uh, judge. It's a big clock, it's counting down, tick, 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 tick. And in front of you at the podium here was another big digital readout so they could see. You know, so it's kind of like a gong show. Everyone knows when that gong is going to go. That's actually very helpful because you know how much time you have left. You want to make the points that, that you want to make. Um, and so you want to know when to kind of pirouette out of the little thorny thinking you've gotten yourself into on your bad issue, get back to your good issue. Uh, if you are speaking first, if you're the, the um, petitioner, you want to reserve some time for rebuttal. Um, you know, three to five minutes, you don't want to save a tremendously long amount of time. Uh, but reserve enough to make a few key points. Now rebuttals, effective rebuttals, are an art in and of themselves. Um, there's this kind of bizarre human inclination to go up and re-engage on the toughest point in the argument, because it's kind of like manning up. I want to just show those judges and show that guy on the other side that I win this point, gosh darn it. And so when the judges leave the bench and they go off to vote, they're left with this muddled complexity. You don't want to do that. You want to get up and go back to the point that says why you win, your best point. That's where we want to get back to your rebuttal. You also don't want to get up and kind of spread the rebuttal. Here are the 16 points my opponent made that I need to respond to in two minutes. Again, really, really bad idea. Slow, concise, nail them. Now, if you're speaking second, if you're the respondent, you don't get the rebuttal, you don't get the last word. But there are some things you can do. My personal favorite is challenging the petitioner to address a certain question. Again, your strongest point. If there's a case that he or she simply cannot deal with, if there's a key fact that is on your side and not on their side, Count your, your honors and your rebuttal, I would challenge my, you know, the, whoever he is you know, to address the following point. And if you're really lucky, when Mr. Starakovich over here stands up, the judge will go, counsel, what about that point? That's kind of the gold standard if you get that to happen. But at the very least, you leave them with a point that you think is important. So when they leave the bench and go back to vote, again, they're thinking about your issues. Okay, conclusion. In conclusion, concluding as much as they must start it. You want to finish where you started, finish with the reasons why you win. It's important to know when to conclude. Uh, you know, the old adage is it's better to sit down early and leave them wanting more than sit down and, or not sit down and leave them, you know, wishing that you had sat down a long time before. I'm sure someone, someone, someone said it, said much better than that. But you, you get the basic point. Know when you're done. The very first oral argument I ever did in the Court of Appeals, uh, I was going second, and the petitioner stood up and this is on the Sixth Circuit. And the judge said, counsel, this is to my opponent, unfortunately, counsel, you're not seriously going to make the arguments that are in your brief, are you? <laughs> he thought about the question. He listened to the question. He thought about the question. And he said, no, Your Honor. It was a fairly short argument. So when I stood up, I said, Your Honor, I, would be, I think you know, our briefs address the issues pretty well, and I uh, don't want to take up the panel's time unnecessarily, so I'm happy to sit down. I then spent the next 20, question, 20 minutes asking questions that I had not anticipated about f the finer points of appellate jurisdiction. So it actually wasn't a cakewalk for me. But that was, you know, the first few minutes were really, of his argument, really fun for me. <laughs> Finally, conclude with a prayer for, for relief. Uh, come up with a formulation that is comfortable for you, something that you will kick out uh, in a smooth manner, which just says why you win. Because judges, uh, at least court of appeals judges, tend to uh, conference immediately after an argument and vote on cases and assign out opinions. You know, things sometimes change after that, but pretty rarely. And when they leave that bench, you want them thinking about why it is that you win. 
Thanks a lot.